know, all of a sudden to see the, the blue water, you know, right next to you. Uh, and you start going down within minutes and it gets dark quickly. And I knew this, it's not like, you know, I'm an oceanographer, I know these things, but to see how quickly it happened um, and how quickly all of a sudden there were all these little flashlights around us. So bioluminescence in the, the water column is really, really beautiful. And you turn off the lights in Elvin when you're going down to save power because it uses batteries. And so it's pitch dark and you just see out the windows these things blinking and some of them are meters long and some of them are tiny and you have no idea what they look like. All you see are these little blue lights um, from the bioluminescence and that was just epically cool. And it's very, very quiet. You know, people would think Alvin would be really loud, but it's, you know, they turn off most of the power sources and you just gently sink down, sink down, and you call up to shore and you use the radio to let the ship know your depth every once in a while, and it's very peaceful. Well, I grew up in the Midwest, in Chicago and Ohio, and there was no ocean there, but there were aquariums, and I just sort of fell in love with the concept of studying the ocean. Uh, I thought I was gonna study coral reefs or sharks or something really exotic like that. And then I went to college and I learned about microbes. They weren't taught in high school, but I learned about them in college, and I became really fascinated with this idea of, you know, microbes regulating important things and being important to Earth's history, and that sort of guided my path this way. So I always knew I'd end up studying the ocean, I just didn't think it would be what it is. Well, so most of the research in the lab focuses on studying microbes that are associated with underwater volcanoes. So that's sort of the biggest picture view I can think of that describes the work in my lab. Right, so when I was a graduate student, I spent a lot of time at sea doing deep sea microbiology, and um, right around that time, genomics was taking off, so using DNA to unravel a lot of things about human health, about microbes, about animals. And I felt like the genomics revolution was kind of passing me by. So I wanted to come to Woods Hole, to the MBL, to learn more about using DNA sequencing technology to understand life on our planet. And so I actually came here with funding from NASA to do that. Um, so I spent a couple of year, years here getting up to speed, and then when there was a chance to get a faculty position, I decided to stick around. There's kind of two modes we operated in. One is basic exploration, so discovering new places on the seafloor, documenting them, collecting samples, asking basic questions. Who is there? How does it work? What's the chemistry like? And the other part is more hypothesis driven, so it's a place we've been before. We have a sense of what's going on and asking more specific questions. Sure, so life at sea is a lot different than life on land. Uh, and so we usually run on four-hour shifts. We are, you know, serving as watch leaders or doing our science in the control van, helping the engineers figure out what samples we want and what to target, what observations we should be making. And then you have eight hours off, which usually means you either sleep or eat or work in the lab. So we use a variety of tools to study our samples. We actually don't do that much at sea just because it's, it's hard to fit in with all the you know, getting the samples. So when we're back in the lab, uh, we kind of do three basic things. We collaborate with geochemists who measure basic things like pH or nitrate or things like that. And then also much more complicated measurements that take a few months to do. And then in my lab, we try to cultivate microbes from these samples. So we try to replicate their environment back in the lab. So we grow them in um, little test tubes where we remove all the oxygen, we give them sulfur, we give them hydrogen, and we heat them up. So we try to bring things back to life in the lab. And the other thing we do is we use a lot of molecular biology to study their genes. Um, and that's sort of universal to any microbiologist. We're just studying kind of weird samples. So we are extracting nucleic acids, looking for particular genes, doing a lot of DNA sequencing. Um, and then once we get all that data back, it's basically sitting in front of a computer, interpreting it, you know, making phone calls to the chemists, finding out what their data said, and trying to kind of piece it all back together. So I'd say, you know, 80% of what we do is actually in the laboratory, and then the other 20% is, is here. So 
I guess there are a lot of different big questions that I'm still interested in. And that kind of goes even deeper beneath the vent. So life actually within the rocks that make up the surface of our planet. So the subsea floor biosphere, what microbes are living beneath the surface of our planet? How many are there and what is their impact on these big global biogeochemical cycles? And what can they also tell us about past past Earth, you know, what used, maybe what used to be happening. Maybe there's just remnant organisms and really old rocks that, you know, we're going to discover all sorts of things. And that has a lot of implications, again, for looking for life elsewhere. I think um, one of the things I'm really excited about is our ability to bring this science back to land more frequently. So if you have a large extension cord on the seafloor, you can plug in a camera and you can run a, run, run a video camera, right? And so being able to kind of bring science back to more of us who don't get the opportunities to go out to sea. And I'm those technological innovations have, just like DNA sequencing has changed how I do my science, our ability to have more of a presence on the seafloor is really changing how we can do our science. It might not be as necessary for me to go to sea every you know, a couple times a year if I can have equipment deployed and monitoring in place and things like that. So I'm sort of excited to see how this interface between engineering and, and, and sciences develops over the next decade. Um, it's a huge infrastructure investment and I'm kind of interested to see how it all pays out. Um, and I'm also, you know, still excited to kind of just go to places no one's ever been before and make a map and bring a camera down and see what we can see. Uh, we've discovered all sorts of phenomenal types of hydrothermal systems, which, you know, only 20 years ago we didn't know existed. Um, we recently documented the first underwater eruption. No one had ever seen one before. We were in the right place at the right time. It's been happening for four billion years. We'd never seen it. And that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. We think about this crowded planet, but there's this big, deep ocean that, you know, we just don't get to see very much. So I'm really excited about, you know, kind of specific things, but then also just sort of the big picture of, you know, finding new awesome stuff.